where the pelvis is rotating in the same plane as the torso and the arm finds its way into that exact same plane and it spirals its way into the ball. All right, so I just wanted to uh, pick out a video of Jordan Hicks that, that was posted a couple days ago, one of his uh, rehab bullpen sessions. Uh, obviously a big Jordan Hicks fan, love watching him throw. Um, I think he brings a lot of excitement to the game, but uh, you know, that was pretty much the sentiment that all the comments were, were saying. And I, I actually saw a couple of mechanical uh, changes or, or tweaks that have been made or intentionally or unintentionally. Um, so I wanted to kind of point those out and just, just show kind of from my perspective what I'm seeing here. Um, but first, let's just play through the videos. Uh, this is, I believe, a 103 or maybe a 104 uh, from a couple of years back. Let that play a couple times. And then this is a rep from his current or his most recent bullpen. So let's just go through kind of frame by frame and, and what are the, some of the things that are jumping out at me. Um, you might just be able to see right at, at a glance some of these differences. Um, but let's just start first off with, uh, with the load into the back leg because again, he is using a more abbreviated leg lift. Um, his quicker leg lift on the right and he's using more of his full leg lift here on the left. So let's kind of compare from when he gets into that back leg load. So right at this position, right here. So the first thing that jumps out to me um, is, is the knee position and the foot position. Now, obviously this isn't the exact same angle, but you can still clearly see right here, knee position, foot position. His knee is not over the toe. Um, even if it was a little over the toe, if we did look at it from a back view, it's not crazy far over the toe. But if we look at this, this bullpen footage, I mean, he's significantly over the toe. All that means here is that he's getting a little bit more of a quad dominant load into the back leg versus more of a, of a glute or hip dominant load into the back leg. And this tends to correspond well with more of a, a toe dominant uh, foot pressure and with the heel rising up. Um, whereas on the left, you can almost think of this like a box squat versus a front squat. Front squat is much more quad dominant with more of an upright torso posture and a box squat is gonna be more of a vertical shin posture with the weight centered over the heel. So he's keeping the heel down longer on the left and, and that's where his pressure is, is centered on the foot. It's more towards the heel, vertical shin, and on the right, he's getting more into the toe. You can already see, see the heel coming up and off there. Obviously, he's still done that at times when he's still throwing very hard, so I'm not saying that he can't do that and get away with it. But it just did strike me how uh, significantly forward he's getting with that knee over the toe compared to this game footage on the left. We can move forward from there. And let's just look at the unload of the pelvis. So, you know, this is not a fully max effort throw, um, but still you can kind of see that uh, there's not that late explosion out of the pelvis that you see in the game. The knee just kind of leaks, 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 leaks down um, because he's just getting into the quad early. There isn't nearly as much of, of that powerful explosion down into landing. Uh, he still does get it a little bit, but it's kind of just leaking down into landing. Whereas on the right, play that in full speed, he's holding that, that vertical shin, he's holding back, and then it just powers uh, through into landing. So right here, he's holding that knee back. He's holding it in vertical, holding it, holding it, and now he lets it uncork at the last second. So he gets that much later rotation of the pelvis by being able to stay into the heel and that keep that vertical shin longer than he is right here. At least that's how it appears to me. Uh, the next thing I wanted to point out is his position at release. Now this is a very telling difference if you look at these two positions. Um, even right here you can, you can see, but uh, let's go to release. So where is the ball, his elbow, and his shoulders at release on the left? They're roughly in line. This is what we look for. This is what most hard, hard, uh, high level throwers do is add ball release, the elbow is straight, the wrist is neutral, they're behind the baseball, they're through the center of the baseball, everything's in line, and they're through that axis of rotation. This is, this is that tornado action that we talk about where the pelvis is rotating in the same plane as the torso, and the arm finds its way into that exact same plane, and it spirals its way into the ball. When you get a little bit linear, what you tend to see is at ball release, you don't have that. So this is the line of his shoulders. Where's the ball? The ball's up here, the elbow's here, just a hair above, 
and the shoulders down here. If we backtrack a frame, it becomes super, super obvious. Um, you can see that elbow is, is way higher um, than the level of the shoulders. So the elbow climb, uh, basically just an indicator of getting a little bit linear, a little bit pushy. Super, super common, especially in TJ rehabs uh, for a number of reasons that we'll get into. But that is just a very telling frame. The other thing that you should, or that I noticed from this release position is look at the position of the torso. So he's relatively upright here. He's almost fully upright with his torso position. I know it's not the exact same angle, but he's, he's getting that good trunk extension on the left as a result of holding the upper half back and loading the back leg properly and staying to the back leg longer. Um, he's getting that catapulting effect, that rotational catapulting effect of the torso out over the front leg. His head is well over the front knee at this point. Uh, again, we don't have a side view here, but he looks almost entirely upright at this point. And so when you're upright, you have very few options to go from here, right? This is basically a chain reaction. At this point, he's just unloading the positions that he's set in motion at the start of the throw. So he's upright, there's very little he can do at this point to not be linear. And so what happens? Typically, the, the combination that you see is back knee shoots, shoots forward, uh, arm pushes, so it becomes more of a downward push versus a rotation around the spine. And then the final thing that you see is that the trunk forward flexes as opposed to rotating around the spine. So let's see what happens. Back knee shoots forward right there. The counter movement to the back knee shooting forward is the trunk forward flexing. So he's getting a ton of rec rectus abdominis and he's basically just forward flexing from here to here into ball release. And then the path of the arm, rather than finishing more around here in line with the shoulders, you can see that his arm is trying to finish in this plane straight downhill into the target. It ultimately does end up over here, but the direction that it takes is much more of a pushing straight downhill action versus uh, throwing through his arm slot like we constantly talk about. Look at him on the left. Let's look at the back foot position, back knee. What does the back knee do? Nothing. There's no shooting forward of the back knee. It's already transferred its energy, the foot stays down, and all that energy has wound its way up into the arm. What happens with the torso position? He's rotating about that axis, and that arm follows through in line with that rotation. So everything sp has spiraled out from the lower half, spiraled up the chain into the torso, and you get this very uh, tight, clean rotation into the ball, and here you end up with a linear follow through. Um, so again, that's, that's pretty much what I'm seeing. There's one more thing I want to point out, which is the front leg action. So look on the left, that front knee, let's go back. From, so from landing, we're looking for what that front knee does. And you can see that front knee stabilizes. There's no forward shifting or lateral shifting of the knee as he rotates. I know the camera's moving, so it's hard to tell. But that front knee sticks pretty well, and so he's getting that, that paw back mechanism, he's getting that stabilization, that lead leg block. If we go to the right, you can start to see it here. He starts to supinate on that landing, on that landing leg. That knee starts to shoot way out to the side. Okay, this, we would consider this poor stabilization transverse plane, so that knee is shooting off towards first base. And that's a sign that he hasn't created an effective lead leg block and that he's, again, getting that more linear follow through versus that rotational follow through through the plane of rotation of his shoulders. So again, just some things that I'm seeing. Um, not trying to pick on Jordan Hicks uh, in particular. Uh, I just you know, had a different perspective about this. This is very, very common when guys are coming back from, from an elbow rehab or a shoulder rehab, uh, really any sort of major injury where they're having to kind of build back up from scratch. It's very, very common because you're dealing with uh, a number of potential compensations. You've, you've had an alteration to the tissue. Your body's sometimes uh, trying to work around certain issues, or maybe you've been kind of rushed or, or accelerated through a program, and so your arm is having to find a way, and your body's having to find a way to accomplish the task before it's actually the tissues are actually ready to accommodate his old mechanics or the way he used to move. Um, so I think he'll actually I think he'll be fine. I think he's going to figure it out. Uh, this could again just be a bad rep in a bullpen. Um, but, but again, this is something to look out for if any of you are going through rehab programs or coaches have athletes going through the rehab processes. Uh, very, very common to see subtle compensations if you, if you break it down. Um, and we just need to be aware of those and, and uh, it can often lead to, well, the guy gets healthy but his velos never quite recovers uh, to what it was pre-surgery. So um, 
the time to hunt for those compensations and deficiencies is during the rehab. It's not after the fact, once they've been cleared, and then you say, oh crap, we gotta figure out what to do now about it. Um, we gotta figure out why his velo's down five miles an hour. And we see this all the time. We see this with our pro guys, big league guys, you know, high school guys, super, super common. So I'm just looking at it through that lens. These are some things that, you know, I'm sure he's already aware of and already working on, on addressing. Um, he's got a motor sleeve on. I'm sure he's monitoring his arm stress. Um, but again, something that, you know, if he's struggling with it, you know that thousands and thousands of other guys are struggling with the same things as far as trying to regain their uh, their form and their uh, mechanical efficiency post post injury. So, uh, hopefully that was informative. Definitely leave any questions and comments down below.